Remember here at Momentum Community Church, last Sunday of the month, we always keep the kids in. We generally just do baptism on the last Sunday of the month, and we generally do uh, communion on the first Sunday of the month, but uh, with all the uh, social distancing guidelines and all that kind of stuff that we have tried to uh, adhere to and apply to the church to keep everybody safe and in accordance with everything that's been going on, uh, we had communion and baptism last week, and it was my honor and my privilege uh, to get to baptize Ms. Lucretia Gilson. Miss Lucretia Gilson, not Mrs. She's not married. Uh, it was my honor and my privilege to get to baptize her. Yeah, give her a hand. Amen. <laughs> it's an exciting time to be able to baptize in the midst of what the world is calling a pandemic. Amen. Amen. Hope to do a lot more of them. Well, <clears throat> last week, I used a couple things uh, to kind of get you to wrap your mind around the Word of God, to reference the Word of God. One of the things I used was an old Guns N' Roses song. You remember that last week? I was talking about that song called Mr. Brownstone. And the lyrics said, I used to do a little bit, a little wouldn't do it. So a little got more and more. I just kept trying to get a little better, a little better than before. We've been dancing with Mr. Brownstone. Uh, is lyrically how the song goes. It was literally talking about uh, those guys when they wrote that, when Axel Rose penned the lyrics to that song, they were actively in a what they call crank addiction, which was a methamphetamine uh, back in the day that a lot of people were utilizing and using to stay up for days at a time. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about that song is uh, the lyricist Axel Rose talks about how he is continually chasing that high. It's like you never get it as good as the first time you got it. And so that's what leads people into being actively addicted most of the time. Is that they are chasing that dragon as they say. They are following after a high that they will never experience again. But man, they'll try anything and everything in the world to do it. Man, we have people who are ODing in the streets today on fentanyl, carfentanil, and heroin. Uh, addictions and methamphetamine addictions and uh, opioid addictions, alcohol addictions, uh, you know, just all kinds of things that Satan is utilizing and using to still kill and destroy. And folks, let me tell you something. When the Word of God is giving us a warning about Satan, Satan uh, walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, it's very literal in its context. Amen. In that he's not playing around. And I've said this before. I'm going to share this again because I, it's just one of the only ways I know to illustrate it. If you've ever watched a lion hunt, most of us, we have this like cartoon impression of what a lion hunts like. You know, oh, you know, a big goofy lion fighting with a big goofy rooster or whatever it might be, you know, uh, on the hunt. But in reality, if you ever go to the Nature Channel or National Geographic or one of those and you actually watch a lion hunt, uh, it's amazing to see all that muscle and tendons and sinew and how cautiously and precautiously every step is thought out, circumspect. It's not skipping around. It's not playing games. He is an executioner that is quietly seeking out what is weak and gingerly and tenderly monitoring every step, every muscle, every hair twitch, every ear movement. It is set about for one reason because lions have a huge heart. And their bodies are 90% muscle. They don't have a lot of fat. Muscle weighs more than fat. Maybe you didn't know this if you've ever been in the, uh, the, the workout industry or the weightlifting industry. You find out that muscle weighs more than fat. But muscle also uses a lot more oxygen than fat does. And so you see these guys that are... Uh, professional strong men, professional bodybuilders, even in the WWE and the WWF and the WCW. Baby. Well, let me tell you something, Mean Gene, Hawkamania is running wild in the Superdome tonight, baby. 
That was my Hulk Hogan imitation. <laughs> you want to hear my Ric Flair? Woo! Huh? But really, when you look at the life expectancy of most of those guys who have ever worked or lived in that profession, it's really short for one of two reasons. It either comes down to the, the steroidal and the drug abuse that inevitably takes their life far too soon, or the other that we find out in the strongman competitions. Those guys die at 35, 45 years old because their hearts have become so enlarged they explode within their chest. And a lion is the same way. Every thought, every step is circumspect and thought out because the lion knows this is my one shot. This is it. My heart is so big that I get one chance to make a sprint for the weakest animal in the pack. And if I kill him, if I drag him down, today I eat. But if I don't, then possibly today I die. For two reasons. I may starve, because who knows when another weak gazelle will come through and I'll be able to have this opportunity. Number two, my heart may explode. Do you know lions die of heart attacks? Most people don't know that. That's one of those animal planet kind of things that you have to research and you find out. But because of this enlarged heart that they have, a lot of times when they go in pursuit and on chase of food, if they don't receive it, the heart is beating erratically and inevitably it explodes within a lion's chest cavity or it'll tear valves loose. Not a lot different than what I experienced back in 2011 with the cardiomyopathy. Most lions, probably, if they were diagnosed by a cardiologist, uh, many of their deaths would be via cardiomyopathy, where their heart became enlarged. The muscle tissue and stuff started to collect all the water that it could get a hold of, and the heart was so enlarged and so muscular that inevitably it began to grow and grow and grow to the point that it starts to tear valves loose and starts to destroy and damage the heart in and of itself. And in damaging the heart, the heart becomes weak and it loses what is called an ejection fraction. You see, your heart beats in a sinus rhythm if it's beating the way it should. That means the top and the bottom of your heart are working simultaneously. This is like patting your belly and rubbing your head, by the way. You have to go through a lot of heart conditioning to really get this down. But I've spent a lot of years studying my heart because of the cardiomyopathy I was lifeline to Indianapolis with. 2011. It reminded me of that circumspect walk and every thought, every step, every hair, every twitch of the ear, every movement is thawed out because that line knows that this is the one opportunity I get to make a kill today. If I don't do it, I may starve, I may die, but I have to be cautious and careful. And so we got to live around in the world that we live in today like we have no cares and no concerns. Right. And yet Satan, our enemy, he is cautiously and precautiously thinking out every step, every approach that he has to take to ultimately destroy us and to listen to me. This is what the word of God says. This isn't Pastor Reno Bait to kill us. He wants us to die in a lost state and condition. He wants us to die void of a relationship with Christ Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no way to the Father except by Him. Amen. And anything outside of that that we are living or we are trying to utilize and use to make it to heaven will ultimately send you to hell today. And so we really need to think about the way we're living. Amen. And so I told you this last week as well. My neighbor... They got Google Maps out trying to create. I still let the string lines there. They've still not come out and surveyed. I'm being a good neighbor, being kind. I haven't went and ripped up all the stuff out of the yard and haven't posted any no trespassing signs or any of that kind of junk because the Bible says vengeance is mine, says the Lord. My neighbor wants to be ugly about that. That's okay, man. It's not a big deal. But I was reminded 
As I was dealing with that, as I was talking with the city planning and zoning commissioner and uh, the guy that is the inspector for the city, and we were talking, we were laughing, just having a guy I went to school with one of them, so we were just talking about old times, and we were talking about the Bailey family, just general conversations. But when I hung up the phone, God reminded me about boundaries, and about boundaries that are in the Word of God. You see, in Old Testament times, and even in the onset of the establishment of the colonies we now call the United States of America, people didn't have barbed wire, they didn't have chicken wire, they didn't have fencing that they could just go out and throw up. Man, you had to cut down trees to make a fence post. Not only did you have to cut down trees, but you had to cut down other trees to make whatever they call the things that lie between the fence posts. Fence. That's what I call them. It was work. And so many times, what the elders would do is they would take a stone. A stone that was identifiable, not just any rock that you picked up out of the yard. Maybe it was something smooth, maybe it was something that had collar. Or maybe they would take a few stones that they could familiarize themselves with. And they would take those stones and they would lay them at the corners of the property. And that, in doing so, established your property lines from stone to stone. It's how you established where your land markers were. But if you had an ill neighbor or someone that wanted to increase their territory and they didn't want to do it through their pocketbook and buy what could legally be theirs, oftentimes what they would do is they would just go out and they would walk those property lines and they would pick up that rock. Now, in picking up that rock, you think, well, that's stupid. They didn't move it 10 foot. They didn't move it 20 foot. They were cautious. They thought it out. It was a very circumspect process that they went through. And so they would move that rock just to the inch. Can you imagine how long it would take just to gain 10 foot on a property line when you might only move that rock an inch or two inches a week? So when the property owner would come out, he'd say, oh, there's my rock. Oh, there's my rock. What's good? They're right where they were at. And little did they know, inch by inch, little by little, centimeter by centimeter, piece by piece, the person next to them was infringing on their property and stealing just a little bit more of their land. And a little bit more. And a little bit more. And a little bit more. You see, I used to a little bit, a little bit do it. So little got more and more and more. And so inevitably, they would confiscate 10 foot of this property line. And maybe your property line ran a, a quarter of a mile, a mile. And then when you begin to look at the square footage, imagine over time how much just a little inch here does it. Folks, let me tell you something. I want to talk to you just briefly today. This is going to be quick. I want to talk to you about boundaries today. Boundaries that God has enlisted and laid out for us, but we have let a mean devil, a devil that is a liar and the father thereof, a devil that is looking to steal, kill, and destroy, not only steal our property, not only move our boundaries, but ultimately wants to kill us and take our life. Because see, back in the day when you were caught trespassing, you didn't call the sheriff, you didn't call the city police. You call it the coroner. That's right. And said, hey, I had a guy, uh, you'll find his body just down past my uh, property stone. He was on my property and he was trying to steal one of my cattle. Or he was trying to take something of mine that wasn't his. And so I left him there for the undertaker to pick up and build his pine box and take him to Boot Hill. You say, all that stuff's only in the movies. No. It's the way our country was built. It's the way it was founded. It's the way property lines were established. I told you, my, my, my literal property margins, I don't know who Dean is, let alone Dean's Lot 5. 
264 by 66 or whatever it is. That was way before any Bates lived there. And I've been there for 50 years now. There's some dude by the name of Dean there that had his stones laid out. Inevitably, time would come and they would begin to measure and mark and set property markers that were more permanent. But you could still pull those property markers and move them. Back in the day, the penalty for doing that was death. You had caught moving somebody's property marker, their boundary, you were done. And so, when we look at the Word of God today, I'm going to preach this, and this may be a sermon series that starts today because there's a lot that I want to get through. If I don't get through all of it today, I'm going to go on next week. Because I think it's important that we understand the boundaries that God is talking to us about in the Word of God. Listen to what it says in the book of Exodus in the 23rd chapter. It says, And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea. Oh, there was another good property marker. That was one of the boundaries that oftentimes couldn't be moved, but every now and then Mother Nature would shift it. That would be a creek or a river or a body of water. We all know where those are at. And so those are easy areas to identify on our plot or our map. Those are our areas. And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines. And from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant. Listen to what this is saying in the Old Testament. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. No promises to keep. No handshake deals. No covenant, God said. When it comes to these boundaries that I've laid out, we will not compromise. We will not discuss. We will not deviate from the path thereof that I have laid out. Amen. Wow. Don't get quiet on me, church. Somebody say amen. I want to tell you what, we're living in a day and a time where we have deviated and fluctuated from all the boundaries that God has ever laid out before us. We still want to be a church that preaches uh, no drinking, no smoking, no cussing. But man, we forget about the million and a half other things that we do every day in our life. And we want to hide those under the covenant of God's grace. Oh, no, 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 no. They're only under his grace when we've asked Jesus into our heart and into our life. And even then, he still doesn't want us to continually protrude beyond the boundaries that have been laid out. He wants us to focus back in on the property that he has given us. And God said that we are the temple of God. You and I, we are the house that he built. Amen. And he gave his son, Christ Jesus, that we might be that temple. I was... This may be a whole other message, but I was thinking about when Jesus came into the temple and he flipped over the table of the money changers. Why did he do that? Why did Jesus, a man who was perfect and without sin, show righteous anger? Because it was his father's house. It was his father's house and he said, my father's house shall not become a den of thieves. And so sometimes we have to take the initiative that when people are trying to infringe on us and move the boundaries, we got to get mad enough every now and then to flip a table over and say, that's it, devil! Amen. I ain't having no part of it! Amen. Come on. Because that old country song says you got to stand for something or you're going to fall for anything. That's right. right. And we are a country, we are a society, we are a church today that has faltered and fallen for anything and everything under the sun. That's right. We preach prosperity gospels. We preach. <laughs> yeah. We preach some of the the, the 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 silliest doctrine that the world has ever known in the world that we live in right now. That's right. Silly doctrine. Stuff that has divided and put 147 churches under the county of Lawrence. 147. There's one on every corner. And there's one on every corner because we have become so divisive in doctrine. We can't stand with one another in unity because of the belief systems that we practice. And folks, let me tell you something. There's good reason that we don't stand in unity 
with some churches. You say, oh, really? It's not right. You preach we should love everybody right where we're at. We should. We should love the sinner, but I'm never going to love the sin. I'm never going to not preach against the sin. And so we have churches that are chasing after the almighty dollar and not chasing after the almighty God. I can't send you into the house of a shepherd who is a ravenous wolf in sheep's clothing and be comforted in my heart to think that I put you in the very place that you're going to be executed. That's right. Me and my would never do that to you. I would never do that to you. I love our people far too much. That's right. Far too much to ever send them into the house of an executioner. Far too much to ever let them jump across the property line that inevitably is going to get them killed. And so we've got to preach truth. We've got to tell our kids about truth. We've got to help people in the society that we live in today understand that love is love with boundaries. Amen. Could you imagine being married to your spouse today? And yet we live in a society where this is one of the marital doctrines that people are practicing. Well, you do what you want to do. I'll do what I want to do. And we'll come home to each other at the conclusion of our evening and tell each other about our extramarital affairs that we've had. Are you kidding me? Oh, I pray that I'm dead before one of my daughters would ever initiate themselves being in a relationship like that. That's right. I'm going to prison anyway at that point. I'm going to kill whoever it is that tried to convince her that that's okay. Amen. That that's all right. Because I know my daughters. I know those little girls. I know the hearts that they have. I know that they're just like any little girl that's ever been in this room. Or any older woman that's ever been in this room, that's ever been a little girl. There was that time you didn't dream about extramarital affairs and you getting to sleep around and your husband getting to sleep around and you come together at the conclusion of your evening and you tell each other about it. No, 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 no. When you were a little girl, you dreamed about boundaries. You dreamed about one man, a knight in shining armor that was going to love you until the day that you died. He was going to defend you for everything that he had. He was going to walk in at the end of a hard day at work and he was going to tell you how much he loved you. You dreamed of the day that you would wear a white wedding gown and that you would march down the aisle and that you would be joined together in holy matrimony to the man that you love. You say, how do you know that, you know? Well, because I had sisters. <laughs> I watched them do that. And the crazy thing is to be brought up in a house where there was no influence of God whatsoever. My dad told people he was the devil. And yet my sisters who were older than me, this is crazy to think back on this and to think that I was the guy that they'd say, okay, we're going to get married today. Reno, you're going to be the preacher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lo and behold, here we are all these years later, man, I'm still doing weddings. <laughs> and a lot of them, folks. I do a lot of weddings. I do a lot of weddings, man. I pray with a lot of couples. But if anybody were to ever come to me and say, hey, Rena, we're going to have a monogamous relationship within our marriage, I'd say, not with my name on the contract, you're not. That's right. Because that's a holy covenant that you make before a holy and errant and fallible God. And when you put your name on the dotted line, I put my name on the dotted line to make it legal in the state of Indiana and before Almighty God. And I will not do that. Amen. I will not openly spit in God's face. That's right. It's the same reason today, and some of you are going to get mad at me for saying this, but it's the same reason today that I will love people that are in the LGBTQ community, but don't come to me and ask me to do your wedding. Amen. That's right. Because it's against the very word of God that I read. How can I unite you in holy matrimony? Holy matrimony. And the life you're living is outside the holiness of God's word. Amen. But we do it all the time, don't we? Yeah. We pass laws. 
for past laws when we legalize things that we never dreamed or imagined would be legalized in the world that we live in today. And it's because we've allowed the boundary lines to be moved. Didn't happen overnight, did it? 20 years ago, we didn't even have that discussion. If we did, it was a real quiet discussion. 40 years ago, you didn't even bring it up because you'd become an outcast in your family. And I'm talking about if you brought up having a monogamous relationship with your husband or your wife. Your parents would have flipped over, flipped down, flipped you over their knee no matter how old you were. And beat your rear in until you got a line back out. Because marriage is a relationship between one man and one woman who unite in a contract with God to become one flesh. Oh, come on. Somebody better help me today. I can go a lot of other areas than just messages uh, on marriage today, folks. But really what I'm talking to you about is the boundaries that God's laid out. This is what it says in verse 33 of that same chapter of Exodus, the 23rd chapter. They shall not dwell in thy land lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. God giving warning, giving warning to us, people, that hey, this is your property. You have been designed to be the temple of God. Dwell in your temple. Love your temple. Don't cross over the property line and allow your temple to become filled with things that are outside of what I intended your temple to be filled with. That's right. Because not only will it become a snare to you, but it will become a snare to others. And ultimately, it will break my heart. God said. Amen. Listen to this as we talk about boundaries today. I'm going to read you some scripture really quick here. And then I'm going to get into the, the meat of the context of what I'm going to preach to you today. And I'm going to do it really fast so that we can get out of here. Hey, listen, if you ain't been here as long as you think you have, it's just hot in here today. Uh, because the word of God is getting stirred up and the devil is mad and he wants you to become uncomfortable in the seat that you are sitting in. But let me, re let me rest you assured. God gave you a blessed assurance that can make it through 20, 25 minutes of good preaching today. Amen. So let's stick it out and stick with the word of God today and hear what it says. Because in the book of Deuteronomy, it goes on in the 19th chapter, in the 14th verse, and it says this. Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. No more moving landmarks. We have moved far too many of them today. That's why people look at the church today and they laugh. That's why what once was a political powerhouse in the world that we live in, that was the church. Not just the Catholic church. Not the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Pentecostal church. The Judeo-Christian church of the United States of America was united because people believe in God we trust. I remember even in my childhood where a Democrat and a Republican didn't falter that far in the beliefs that they have. I also remember a time when everybody washed their cars before they came to church and every man wore a suit and every lady wore a dress every Sunday to walk into the house of God. Yeah. But we moved the property lines a little bit at a time. I used to do a little bit, a little bit, and do it, so a little got more and more. Just kept trying to get a little better, a little better than before. I want the offerings to go up a little better than they've been. So I'll, uh, I'll move a little bit of what God's word says. I want the crowds to be bigger because I got an ego and I want to preach to more people. So I'm going to move the boundaries just a little bit. And never move the boundaries get moved inch by inch, meter by meter, centimeter by centimeter until we've inevitably taken feet out of the words of God. To where we preach in many churches today a doctrine that is void of hell and void of Satan. That's right. Because we're afraid that it's going to be offensive or abusive to somebody. We preach a, a gospel 
that is void of telling people that their sin will send them to hell. That's right. Because we inevitably are afraid that they're going to ultimately walk out the door and not walk back in because they got their feelings hurt. Great. Great. Folks, I've been at this long enough that I don't even hear this anymore. And I remember a time when people would shake my hand after service and say, Whoo, brother, you danced all over my toes tonight. That's right. You stomped my feet. Good old boys there, they come out after service, man, and big old sweaty armpit hugs. And they'd say, man, son, you need to preach like that, I don't have to wear my steel toe boots tomorrow. Stepped all over my toes, son. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. Amen. They can preach the word of God. That where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That we can preach with that liberty and that spirit of truth. And not have to worry about offending people to the point that they'll never come back to the house of God. Amen. <coughs> Folks, I believe the days are numbered. That's right, man. And I believe the Word of God teaches us that. And that our time on this earth, it may be shorter than any of us have ever dreamed or imagined. And that being said, folks, I've even found myself trying at times to compromise on the boundaries because I wanted a bigger crowd or we needed bigger offerings to keep the doors open. No, we didn't. They're still open, aren't they? Amen. Jesus is still paying the bills because I'm not. Amen. So Jesus is still paying the bills. The doors are still open. Amen. God said, I'll keep you going. If you'll ask and you'll seek and you'll not, don't compromise. Amen. Don't compromise on what my word says. Listen to this. Wow. I love this today. Because listen to what the book of Luke says. It talks about the rich man and Lazarus. A rich man. <laughs> Man, he wanted to compromise on every account to hold on to his earthly wealth. He'd do whatever it takes to hold on to the toys of this world that he had. To the point that he would excuse himself from a relationship with God. And so, quickly paraphrase, the Bible tells us that the rich man and Lazarus both of them enter into a place called Abraham's bosom. And then it says that all of a sudden they are divided. They are separated far, far, far apart. One is carried off into Abraham's bosom and the other is placed in a place that we know as hell. The rich man is placed in hell. Now there's a lot that can be preached out of this and I'll preach it. I'll preach it with everything that I got in me but I don't want to give you all of it today. I just want to give you this part. In verse 24 in this story, we hear this rich man, Lazarus, who had nothing in this life, but he had the boundaries that God gave him. He had to lay at the gate of the temple and beg for money, and the dogs licked the sores on his body. He had plenty of opportunity, I'm sure, to compromise the way he was living for something far better. But it would have been just that, a compromise. A compromise against God. And so he would rather lay at the temple gate, covered in sores, with the dogs licking his wounds, as to compromise and follow the path of the rich man. Who we hear in verse 24, and it says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Listen to this. Abraham being a picture of God to us. But Abraham said, Son, why well, say, Son? Sounds like God got a little southern accent to him, don't he? Son! Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things and likewise Lazarus the evil things. 
but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Some of you, some of you haven't even made it to hell yet, and yet you are experiencing the torment of life all around you because you move boundaries. Your kids are rebellious. My folks, I'm just preaching truth. Your kids are rebellious. Because maybe not your household, but somewhere, someplace, people have moved boundaries. My oldest daughter right now would rather live anywhere else in the world than live under my roof. Because she doesn't like the boundaries that I have in place for her. She hates it. And guess what? The law that established the boundaries still a law that I apply to her life today, whether she likes it or not, as long as you live under my roof. That's right. You're going to live by my rules. You may not like it, but until you're old enough to do something about it, these are the boundaries that we have established. Amen. And the Word of God says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. We may not do it perfectly. Amen. We may err not just from time to time, but all the time. But just because we are all the time doesn't mean that we are going to give up on serving God in our house. Amen. Right, man. Verse 26 says, And beside all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from this. Ain't no travel back for it. What's God separated you? It's it. When you've taken your place in a devil town, there is no purgatory. There is no buying yourself out, rich man. There is no other way out. You have determined your destiny forever. That's right. And the life that you lived on this earth, the boundaries that you were willing to cross and even remove entirely from your life. Then in verse 27 it says, Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father. Oh, now it must have broken. And that's where we are. We've moved the boundaries, moved the boundaries, moved the boundaries, and now we are living in hell on earth. Our life is falling apart. Our kids are rebellious. Our wife, our husband's about ready to leave us. Our life is anything and everything but exciting anymore. As a matter of fact, it is a drudgery and a misery to live every day because we have been living it absent and void of God Almighty and in our household. And so then he said, I pray thee therefore, our Father, that thou wouldest sit all men there's people praying today. Go ahead. They're praying. But who are they praying to? What are they praying about? Your prayers are bouncing up the ceiling and bouncing up the walls and bouncing up the floor. Because God can't, God can't hear your prayer until you've prayed the prayer that says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yep. And then the Word of God teaches us that Jesus becomes our intercessor. Because even then we don't know how to pray. Not as we should, the Word of God says. But God gave us Jesus to be an intercessor for us. Because He always knows how to pray. And so all we can do is just pray without ceasing, give it our best shot, and know that if we have asked Jesus Christ into our heart and into our life, that Jesus is praying just exactly what we need. Not my will, but thine will be done. Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Listen to what Abraham says in verse 29. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. My biggest distraction week in and week out. It's not a distraction. I love being a pastor. I love ministering the Word of God. But I have people that come to me every week that think that I'm going to be somebody in their life's Savior. They think that I'm going to be the salvation that their son or their daughter needs. They say, Reno, if you would just talk to them. If you would just 
tell them your story. If you just tell them about what God's brought you through. If you just tell them about you being in prison and jail. If you just tell them about how God saved you. I know it worked for them. No, it will not. It takes the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God Amen. to move on an individual's heart to be saved. Folks, I'm just preaching straight truth today. I know, that, man, the churches have been so absent, so void from hearing truth for so long. I can see people right now, man, just shutting me off. Man, I don't like that. Because little Jim Bob or little Betty Sue needs to know Jesus and what he's preaching. They ain't going to know Jesus. You're right, they're not. Unless you reestablish the boundaries Amen. that God set up for you to have in your life. Right. Abraham said that him, they had Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. You know what I have up here on this table today? Guess what? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, so on and so forth. All through the New Testament, you know what this is? This is Moses and the prophets. Amen. Every one of them, 66 books, immaculately and miraculously put together to show us what the boundaries should be in order to live our life according to the Word of God. That's right. Amen. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, here is his insistency. When you're in a pinch, man, you get desperate. He's in hell and he's desperate. And he says, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went into them from the dead, they will repent. Oh, they won't. Oh, they won't. I would, I would still throw this out there. Oh, so I'm going to be quick today. You guys are making me preach long because you're not helping me. Preach it. <laughs> you want to hear the truth? You know why they won't believe one that even if he came back from the dead? Because we'll spend this whole month glorifying death. That's right. We'll go to every haunted house. We'll watch every scary movie that's put on TV. We'll teach our kids that all death is nothing to be afraid of. It's not that my mom used to tell me it's not the dead that'll kill you when I go in the graveyard. She said it's alive that will. Oh, that's the truth. We live in a society today where there's a walking dead and we talk about zombies and stuff and say, well, that's all fictional. Really, man, have you been to Walmart after midnight? It's crazy some of the things that you'll see. Some of the places where we go and live out in our own community. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, verse 31 says, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And you know what the ultimate picture was that he was portraying for us? Is that if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, then they're not even going to be persuaded when Jesus rose the stone away. That's right. And removes himself from death, hell, and the grave for all eternity. Arise, my love. Arise, my love. The grave no longer has a hold. No more suffering. Arise, my love. Arise. Man, if the death of Jesus and him overcoming the grave don't get us stirred up. Amen. I mean, we've literally had a dead man walking in the midst of us. To prove that God's word is true and that the boundaries that he laid out, they're there to guide us and direct us. Dale, give me one verse and I'll stop. Give me the book of Acts, the 17th chapter, and as you stand with me today, listen to what? Verse 26, Dale. Verse 26. In the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, listen to what this says. This, again, it's Paul's sermon on Mars Hill that we are talking about here. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and he said to the men of Athens, 
are perceiving all these things, you are too superstitious. We become a society that absolutely, absolutely. is ruled and run by superstition. Amen. We tell each other, I, mean, I do it too. I tell people good luck. Yeah. When in reality, luck shouldn't even have a place in our conversation. That's right. Because I'm not looking for luck. No. I'm looking for Jesus. Right. Yeah. Right. When I go to look at the boundaries of my property, I'm not just hopefully uh, or thinking that I might be lucky and it might be over here or something. No, 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 no. Surveyors have come out and established where those boundaries are at. I have proof. We have proof in Christ Jesus. It says in verse 26 this, And have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. That's right. You see, God's already given us our boundaries. He knows where we're at. He knows where every foot should be placed. Every step should be taken. Every breath I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Because on the other side of my step is a devil. That's right. Who is circumspect and cautiously seeking out a way to steal, kill, and destroy my life. And so I want to walk in the boundaries that Christ Jesus has placed out before me in my life. Amen. That's right. Amen. Don't get off the trail that Jesus has laid out. Because the trail that he set out says narrow is the pathway that leads to righteousness and few there be that find it. But broad is the road that leadeth to destruction and many there be that go in that. They move the boundaries, they widen the road, anything goes, they dance and skip and all the while they are parading on their way to a devil's hell. That's right. Church, it's time that we lift our voices back up. Amen. It's time that the church become the political powerhouse that God called us to be. Amen. That's right. In God we trust. Yes. It's time for us to take a stand and to establish the boundaries that God has given us in this great United States of America again. Amen. It's time for us to take hold of the horns of the altar and say, God, I'll ride it all the way to heaven, but I'm not letting go. The old evangelist used to say, pray until you pray, plumb through. That's right. We can't even get people to pray anymore, let alone get a hold of the horns of the altar and pray until they pray, plumb, plumb, through. Amen. Get, 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 get. And that's all, folks. <laughs> that's my sermon for today. Boundaries. God's established them. Where are we living at in them? Would you bow your heads with me today? I want to ask this really quickly. You see, boundaries have to begin at the cross. Sanctification is a process. It doesn't happen all at once. It starts at the cross and it goes on throughout the days of your life. You say, we don't even know what sanctification is. It's alright. It's just a big term for living Christ's life. If you want to live a sanctified life, you must first ask Jesus into your heart and into your life. And so if you haven't done that today, I'm not going to ask you to slip up a hand. I'm not going to ask you to jump up and down. I'm not going to ask you to shout out. I'm going to ask you to simply do this. If today is the day that you want to ask Jesus into your heart and into your life, I'm not going to be long. So I don't want you to tarry. I want you to take the time to step out from where you're at right now and come forward to this altar because I think in doing that, you are initiating a change. You are saying to the devil, shut your mouth. I am establishing some boundaries in my life and I'm unashamed and I'm unafraid to do it. And so I'm not going to cower behind a raised hand or a lifted paw. I'm going to fall on my face before a holy God at an altar and ask him into my heart and into my life. If you want to make that decision to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, please step out from where you're at right now. Come do that right now. Right now. I'm not going to tarry. 
And as we wait for anybody and everybody that would come to the altar for the church today, for somebody somewhere here today, I'm telling you, folks, the Lord is saying needs to make their way out and ashamed and unafraid of this altar. Maybe you need to rededicate your life today. Maybe you need to reestablish some boundaries. This altar is here for you. Before you leave this church today, don't worry about these cameras. I'll shut them off. But I want the people that are watching us online to know as well that you can fall on your face at your couch, at your love seat, at your rocking chair today, and you can ask the same prayer that I'm about to pray, and it'll be just effective where you're at as it is here in the house of God today. And that is a prayer that said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my trespasses. Forgive me of the wrongs that I've done. Forgive me, Lord, that I have trampled the blood of Jesus under my feet. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to be unashamed and unafraid to live my life for you. Forgive me, and I ask today that I become a child of God. I ask you into my heart and into my life. And so God, please, give me direction. Show me the boundaries. Show me the gates. Show me the fences. And God, I'll do my very best to honor you with the life that I live. I pray and ask it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, you need a Bible. We've got one for you here at Momentum Community Church. If you're watching us online, you don't have a way to get a Bible, and you're sitting at home, and you would love to have one, you'd like to read it, please let us know. Reach out to us either through the Great United States Postal Service or catch us online, and we will find a way to ship your Bible out right to your front door. Because one of the things that we know that works here at Momentum Community Church is that prayer is our way of communicating with God and God wants to hear from us daily, all the time. Amen. That's right. Secondly, Amen. God gave us the Word of God to instruct us and to teach us. And so God wants to speak to us and He'll do that through the Bible. Amen. You say, I don't understand the Bible. I don't understand that old King James Version. It was written on a third grade reading level. You can understand it. You just have the same problem that I had. When I picked it up a million different times and didn't understand it. It wasn't until I prayed and asked Jesus into my heart and then asked him, God, help me understand your word. Look at me now, Mimo. Up here telling other people about all the wonderful things that I've learned through that blessed book that God gave me called the Holy Bible. Amen. If you need a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. If you need somebody to pray with you, please reach out to us here at Momentum Community Church. We have people uh, here that would love to be a prayer partner with you in your daily walk and life and to encourage you in your walk with Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, I pray that you dismiss us in your love and your mercy and grace. We love you today and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.